Neurodiversity Matters Conference. Uh, we just had some great uh, interviews with other organizations. And now we have our next panel discussion, which is featuring a number of playwrights who are currently working with STE on the Neurodiversity New Play Festival. This panel is uh, being moderated by the amazing Gary Garrison, uh, who is so nice to come and help lead this discussion for us. So with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Gary. Thank you, Clay. Hi, everybody. Uh, so before we get started talking about the kinds of things that we think might be of interest to you and, and certainly to any playwright that is working in the American theater right now, I thought we should start by if we could get you guys to introduce yourselves and also tell us a little bit about what you're doing with Spectrum. Dave? Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Dave Osmondson. I am a playwright and dramaturg, and I am going to be uh, dramaturging some pieces for a Spectrum Theater Ensemble. And I may or may not have a play in their uh, Neurodiversity Play Festival later this summer. Stay tuned for the announcement. <laughs> Jeremy. Hi, uh, it's good to be here. Hello to everybody. And um, I, uh, I first worked with Spectrum in 2015, I think, 2016. And um, they had done a device theater project for a few weeks and then I joined for a week and um, did some, some workshops with it as we brought it to form. And then um, from there, uh, I came back and developed a piece with seven ensemble members over the course of a year of a play that we now call The Importance of Being. And, um, and that will be read also as part of this festival. And um, I'm writing um, a 10 minute play as part of this festival as well. Great. Hi, Amina, thanks for joining Hi. us. Thanks for having me. Uh, my name is Amina Henry and I'm a playwright and um, I am collaborating with um, members of the group to write a 10 minute play for the festival. Terrific. Members of the, of the ensemble. Sure. Dean? Um, yeah, thanks for, I'm glad to be here. And um, I'm a playwright and I'm working on a 10 minute play uh, somewhere around aging and neurodiversity. And um, so right now we're in workshops having conversations with a bunch of actors about what aging is like. That's great, that's great. Well, listen again, thank you for joining us. So um, all of you are, as we said at the very top of the uh, introduction, are working with Spectrum. So I'm curious, um, how Spectrum is feeding you or how you are feeding Spectrum. Like how does, tell me how it feels to have found this company or for this company to have found you and what it means to you as a playwright. Yeah, um, well, um, as someone who has uh, Asperger's syndrome, um, neurodiversity in theater is something that I've been thinking a lot about recently and kind of my relationship with my autism as a playwright and how that factors into my work. And um, I think it's really great that there is um, a theater company that's dedicated to um, having uh, neurodiverse people, neurotypical and atypical people in collaboration to create works that uh, revolve around um, people who are on the autism spectrum. And I think um, there's gonna be a lot of really interesting opportunity to tell like different stories about people on um, the autism spectrum. And I'm really excited for the potential of that. Great. Um, I, I'm just really grateful to have the opportunity to collaborate with new people. So Spectrum has offered me that, I love that. Um, and has trusted me with the task of of developing a piece uh, for the group. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm really excited to have the opportunity to learn more about autism. Um, so that's been really great. And Amina, when we, we had talked about this uh, not so long ago and you were talking about your rehearsal process that you just, I think you had just come from your rehearsal process. And I was saying, well, was that, was that, uh, that experience different for you or was there anything of particular note about it? And, can you share what you were what you shared with me then? Because I thought it was really interesting. Um, it's like, what did I share? I don't remember. Um, I think um, I think I said that uh, it felt like a pretty um, normal workshop process in the sense that I was just with actors and a director, um, 
and a stage manager kind of sorting through what stories we want to tell um, and getting to know each other. Um, we actually didn't talk about autism at all um, during my workshop. So that was kind of interesting. I, so in a way it was, it, it wasn't any different from a regular rehearsal process, but, but there was maybe a little bit of a difference uh, because number one, it was the first time I've tried to have a workshop on Zoom or on a computer. So that was one thing, but then also there, uh, the actresses that I'm working with, they, there is a slight difference kind of, but, it, but it's hard for me to articulate what it is. Um, so on the one hand, it was the same. And on the other hand, it was different, but uh, they were very eager and very humble and very just open and willing to play. So that was really great. Sure. That, by the way, that is exactly what you said. Okay. <laughs> great. I just wanted to share that because I thought it was so interesting because it, it was your first rehearsal and you did, you know, you'd walked into it kind of looking to see what was going to happen and what was going on. And, you know, as you reported, there wasn't really anything to report. Um, I'm curious, has it changed over time or has it stayed pretty much the same? Um, it's, I mean, I, I'm at the point right now where I'm s still trying to figure out what the play is going to be. So I haven't really been right. communicating with the actresses. Um, I just, I, cause I, I'm still looking for my, I'm still processing all of the stuff they gave me. Sure. Jeremy, anything that you want to tell us about your uh, relationship with Spectrum? Yeah. Um, so just having it been four or five years now, and I don't, I don't live in Providence, but I've, I've made several trips there and spent a lot of time there. And, um, you know, on one level, maybe the basic level or maybe the, what it's all about is, is it's just building community and, you know, art is a form of building community and being able to do that in an authentic way. Um, I think there are a lot of inauthentic ways to build community. And I think this is, you know, being able to sit down and work together and listen to each other and make, create together is, um, there's just nothing like that. It's the antidote to, to all the cynicism and all the, the sort of things out there, political and personal otherwise in our, in our world today. And so, you know, and I, I think the other idea, the other feeling I have is just like this notion of inclusion, something that too in, in, um, implies a sense of power of who gets to include and who doesn't. Mm -hmm. And what's, what's um, so valuable to me about this, this uh, company is like Dave was saying the it being a mix of neurodiverse, neurotypical, um, the empowerment kind of shifts in a way and where I felt, oh, okay, thank you for inviting me in. And we could actually build into like something of a, a true sense of what it means to include each other. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing I think is, is well, two, two small things. I think other, um, I really appreciate that this company is also doing some of the work to um, for the artists that are involved who did not get opportunities along the way, this company is doing it and producing professional work. So it's both, we are learning, we are growing as artists is very much up in the front and center, but also we are still doing it. We're not using that um, missed opportunity in the past as a reason to like, wait, you have to do this training, you have to go through this channel. No, we're gonna create it ourselves. Mm -hmm. We're gonna create our own channels. So I think that's really exciting to see in five years to see the um, the ensemble grow as actors, as um, as theater artists has been really exciting. And then the last thing, very on a personal level, you know, I used to be uh, I was a, a third grade teacher and a middle school teacher for like eight years, and um, having had this experience and and all the conversations we had, it, it made me go back to all those years of me teaching and wondering what things I missed. You know, I'm beating myself up, <laughs> but also in, in a sense for like, like hot, like just just a reminder um, and a um, a put personal push to always always go beyond what just comes to you in in life in whatever sort of um, things that are, are that make up one's identity externally or internally. Um, that looking back at that has actually like um, made me see the world a little bit um, in a broader way again. Terrific. Dean? Um, I feel like a, a real newbie. You know, I, I, I think Spectrum Theater found me through Jeremy this year. And I have an autistic nephew who's six. Um, and so I 
felt like working with Spectrum was a way to be closer to him and understand his world better. Um, but it, certainly I'm learning a lot as I go. Um, and I, I, you know, these workshop, these first workshop days that we're having feel a little bit more like we're just talking and about ideas and uh, life experience together and then we'll see what happens from that. But that I think similarly is not particularly remarkable. We're all just coming from various walks of life just like we often do in a rehearsal room and we're sharing what those are. And even in rehearsal rooms where I'm not with Spectrum, I'm always surprised by somebody's life experience that I wasn't expecting. Um, so it feels somewhat similar in that way. Great. Yeah, and, and one thing that I, that I think I, I feel like I should mention, I think I, I maybe was told, but maybe forgot, or maybe was told after, but um, I thought that all of my actresses, all three of them were on the artistic spectrum and actually only two of them are, but I didn't know, like I didn't quite realize like which one of which two. And so that was interesting to me. Um, and it just, it's got me really thoughtful about um, kind of the scope of human nature anyway, because they, they just seem like, and sort of thinking about the spectrum because they really, they, maybe there are slight differences, but they really um, are different in the sense that we're all unique and different. And being autistic was not all of who they were clearly, um, or even the most interesting thing about them. So that was great for me to remember as I was, working with them. Interesting. Well, actually, which kind of leads me to my next question, which is, this is a, uh, this is, this panel today is called a round, a round table on creating neurodiverse plays. So I, I uh, uh, anybody tell me what that means or what that is or what it means to you. I don't know that there isn't a, you know, a, a blanket answer for that, but what does it mean to you particularly? Yeah, um, well, something that I think about a lot, I think about a lot as a theater goer and playwright is um, like there are a lot of really great plays about autism that are written by people who aren't on the spectrum. And it gets me, th it gets me thinking a lot about um, how can we make room for playwrights who are on the spectrum to tell these stories. And I think it starts a lot with um, hiring like autistic actors, autistic directors, um, centering stories about autistic people. Um, Curious Incident of the Dog of the Night, so I think it's a very good example of this. Um, and I think the definition of neurodiverse plays is, I feel like like autism, there can be many definitions of neurodiverse plays because every autistic people experiences autism in a different way. And I think creating neurodiverse plays um, could be a really good way of kind of honoring that wide range and diversity of experience. And Dave, I know you also self-identify in other ways as well. So do, do those, uh, particularly in our introductions, you had said that you also identify as a queer playwright, which I do as well. Mm -hmm. So do you find that you are marrying those two things together in this work? Or is it just, or, or there is no formula for it, it's just whatever happens happens when you tell a story? Um, I mean, my, I, I find that my queerness and my autism kind of seeps its way into all of my plays somehow. There's only, I think there's, I only have like a few plays where they are directly linked. Um, but I wrote a play called Light Switch that featured a queer autistic character because I'd never seen that experience portrayed before. I think the only other, um, I could be totally wrong, but I think the only other story about queerness and disability being intersected that I've seen was uh, the Netflix series special, which if you haven't seen it, it's great. Um, but I think a lot about how the idea of queerness is kind of going against a prescribed norm and I may be totally off base in saying this, but I feel like in many ways, um, autism kind of queers neurotypicality in many ways. Mm -hmm. um, I think one is um, since um, autistic people are uh, often wired differently, um, they tend to look at the world and at least in my experience, kind of a more 
questioning manner of, oh, why do people act this way? What kind of rules are they following? What will they get out of following these rules, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So um, that's one way I think um, autism is kind of a queerification of neurotypicality. Okay. Someone else? Well, I lost the question because I got so interested in Dave's yeah. answer. <laughs> um, but I was just going to add that, like, as a queer playwright, I, my room is like three three queer men and one uh, one heterosexual man. Like, that's how our um, our workshop room is broken down right now, anyway. And I think one is neurotypical and three are neurodiverse. It's just um, it's fun the way those things are breaking down. But I think the question was something about like what is a neurotypical uh, diverse play, right? Or when, and I have no idea. I'm sorry. I'm mm. just. How is it defined for you, or how are you defining it, or yeah. are you defining it, or anything like that? I think I'm. I'm not at this point, and I. Um, I've also shifted artistically from writing plays that are more identity based to to thinking more metaphorically and sort of mm. in different ways. So I'm curious where those things overlap, or like you know when I look at my nephew and he wants to put on his big. Um, earphones because everything is too loud. I think, oh yeah, me too. Like, <laughs> there's too much stimulation in the world. And so, I guess I'm sort of curious as to um, the human experiences that are mm -hmm. maybe have the the details that are slightly different, but that are just so um, mm -hmm. basically human. And and trying to see what comes from that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Dean, what what pulled you into this project, or what? What was what was that kernel, that moment that you were pulled in? And you thought, yeah, I want to do that. I want to explore that, or I want to understand that, or any of those things. I think when I was talking to Clay originally, I said, you know, what I don't want to, do, what I don't feel qualified to do because I'm not um, autistic, is to write a play that's about that particular experience. Mm -hmm. And then I just think artistically, where I am for this to be kind of also useful to me is, I don't want to just write a story about here, this is who this person is and give it to you. I just, I'm more interested in, and I'm, I think I'm, as a person in their mid forties, I'm, I'm between generations. So that is something that's um, a particular lens through which I'm looking at the world now. Mm -hmm. And uh, Clay was excited by that too. And so we, I, I'm particularly also, I love working with older actors. I think um, the break times and the stories they have are just so fascinating that it makes all of it worth it just to spend time with them in the room. You bet. I mean, can I ask you that same question? What pulled you into this? What What was that thing that hooked you in? And you said, yeah, I want to explore this or I want to attach myself yeah. to this to figure out X or to understand Y or any of those things. Um, I don't know if it was just, if it was one thing, I think it was a number of things. Uh, Jeremy initially uh, pulled me into the project and I, I think um, I was really interested in the idea of, of being a playwright who performs a particular service um, because it's a commissioned piece and it's not actually about me or it's not like, oh, I'm gonna sit down and write a play and then actors are gonna come and be in it. It's really about, okay, how can I best articulate for me what the women that I'm working with want to articulate. Like what is the story they, that we want to tell together about their experience is really interesting to me. I love working with women. So, and my room is women. Um, I, I mean, it's interesting. Like I don't really know either necessarily what a neurodiverse play is, but I also don't quite know all the time. Or I don't have a, a consistent answer about what a black play is or what a female play is. So just kind of like, I, uh, you know, it's a neurodiverse play because we're all neuro neurodiverse who are involved, I suppose. Sure, sure, sure. <laughs> but again, I, yeah, I know yeah, exactly what you mean. Sure. Um, like I, I'm a little bit hesitant to put the our, the play that I put my play in that particular kind of box. Uh, mm. But at the same time, I think until it becomes very unconscious and very sort of all the time, I think you have to be really mindful about it and sort of say it. So I, I don't know, like I get a little bit um, wishy-washy and befuddled when, when we talk about point access points of identity. Cause I'm like, sure. cause there are so many different ways that people identify. Cause as I said, these women um, being um, 
neurodiverse was not the most interesting thing about them necessarily. We, we were all racially diverse and that came up a bit. Um, we were all, like we're all just so different, um, even as women, so yeah. So can I ask you then, can, to, can you just detail a little bit of your process? Like, are you walking in asking questions, or walking in having a discussion? Are you saying, let's find common ground? So what's been your approach to the process of creating? Um, I asked a lot of questions uh, and let them ask me questions. And I also, and it was very conversational and um, our director uh, had them do a few, or not a few, had them do some physical exercises based on some of the answers to our question, to, to the questions. And then based on what they did physically, that gave me some thoughts to write down for notes and mm -hmm. things that, I, that I'm kind of still processing for later. So mm -hmm. our pieces, I think, more devised than I usually deal with, but that's exciting to me. Sure. Because I find devised theater actually really intimidating because I'm super controlling. So. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a good exercise for me. By the way, you and everybody else on this panel. <laughs> <Just saying. laughs> Dave? Yeah, um, I something that Amina said that really struck me was, um, like she said, she wasn't entirely sure how to define like a woman play or like a black play. And I feel like... Um, like asking what is a neurodiverse play or what is a black play, or what is a female play kind of runs the risk of, um, of having marginalized groups have like, you know, one representative of playwrights. And I feel like in all, in really any experience, like there's um, capability for a wide range of stories to be told. Um, speaking for myself, I hope that, um, I hope that my play about being queer and autistic doesn't become the play about being queer and autistic. I really hope it opens the door for like a variety of stories about queerness and autism and how they intersect. And I think in defining what is a neurodiverse play is acknowledging that there is room for all those experiences. Sure. Well, particularly if you, you know, if you had any work done in a festival before and you you realize from whatever position you stand in or sit in that you are the queer playwright in the group, you are the female playwright in the group, you are mm. the black playwright in the group, you know, there's a weight on that that I don't think anybody wants on their shoulders, frankly. Um, Jeremy, what about you? Are there things, is there anything about uh, in your work that you particularly respond to in, a, in this label of a neurodiverse play, if there is such a thing? Um, I, I agree with mostly what people had said. I, I think maybe I'm interested in the question about um, what, what drew me in as me being someone who's not on the spectrum um, and then what that process was. Uh, I mean, for me, I the, I, the adage of write what you know is only half the equation. I think it's where my story meets something outside my story is, is um, where I, tend to go as an artist. I, I think that um, writing for me has always been my way to travel, whether it be geographically or interpersonally, emotionally. Um, and so, so uh, when I, um, I find that the, the, the process of it was really forced, kind of what like Amina was saying, forced a level of collaboration that, or made visible a level of collaboration that um, should be there anyway, but, um, it, 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 I felt like the starting point had to be um, listening and and not, not, I don't know what it is, but I know what it's not, not that I am like going to translate it, that that felt wrong too, but, um, but listening and finding how like each piece of the, the, the story shaped by people's views, their own stories, who they are, um, that meeting point started to like coalesce into a story. And what was interesting is I ended up writing a play that I wanted to write anyway, but I didn't know who was in it or what happened in it or anything. Um, but there was something that struck like, oh, that is an idea that I had. And then we kind of um, built it from there where I would write a scene um, based on some activities we did. And then we'd share those pages get to have a long talk a bit, 
about it. And often the scene that would end up happening would be based on the talk about the scene rather than the scene. Uh, so it was, it was great to be able to just kind of have that luxury of time, but also the premise of it itself was like ensemble, true to the name of the company and its vision. And uh, so that was exciting to work that way and really um, to, to think about like Dean is talking about, you know, identity plays and such and, and, and myself moving into how can I collaborate as a writer and how can I, you know, as much as I love playwrights and myself, how can I, how, how does that, how does that role look different? Um, not just in this circumstance of an ensemble, but even just in where we're going as a society, um, instead of the, the playwright, you know, you cannot change that word um, and all those sorts of things. Like what is, what is, what does that look like? Um, and where does the written word that I've been come up with meet something devised uh, felt like a, an end to this sort of project? Right. So uh, we have four writers in the room. So I, I have to ask if, if, as you kind of carve your path forward, if you kind of go towards the, the end of that path, just for fun's sake and looking back, if you could look back and see what, what, you, what you have created, what you think you might create, what's kind of in your future, something that you're dying to do, but just haven't done yet. What does that look like to you? What would you say you put forward into the universe? This, I'm just curious as writers, what is it that you particularly are trying to respond to and put forward for us to see or take a look at or understand or examine or what are you writing is really what I'm asking. And, and what would you we like don't us know to know yet? <laughs> <laughs> no, but you you're know, asking, but you're you asking me to astral project in like seven so years. Pressure. Oh my gosh. <laughs> you, have, you have passwork though. So if you look at that password and you kind of look at the, where you think you might be in the future, what does that all look like in total? I'm curious, Dean? I think for me, um, I can see that like I'm always changing form or something like there's something about a newness of form. Um, so um, I'm always a little terrified of the next day I write because I don't really have a set way that I do it. Um, I'm definitely exploring things about, I think, both intergenerational uh, miscommunications, but also I think I try to inhabit the people that my community would say are the enemy and try and understand whether anything they're saying about me is true. And then I think there's a, a way we can have a different kind of conversation. So, and then there's something about metaphor that I'm, I think my plays are getting more metaphorical and perhaps more absurd if that's the right word, I'm not really sure. Um, and someday I would like to write for puppets or do a, but I don't know, that thing like escapes me, it's a little too far away. Just to see what that is like, just to know. Right. Do you know? Do. do you know why you might be veering towards metaphor, for example? Do you have any idea? Yeah, I think there's something um, I'm interested in about meaning that is not like a linear thing, but layered on top of each other. And a very satisfying theatrical experience to me is um, I don't fully know what's happening, and then the bottom drops out, and then I'm still processing as I go home. I I, I don't easily understand what what the experience was for me. And I think a linear plot driven thing, I get it. And I can like it or not like it, but it feels less profound to me than something that, I don't know, rips apart my world in some way that I don't even, it's I guess because it can bypass some part of your logical thinking and get to some other part of you that where understanding lives that's sort of apart from just logic. Right, good. Dave? Um. I guess what this question is kind of making me think of is this past semester in my dramatic writers workshop, we focused a lot on writing plays for youth. And I wrote a play um, called The Dummy Class about um, special needs children in like the early 2000s. And as I was writing it, like I'm not just um, conversing with the wider audience, but also with my inner child who, um, unfortunately endured quite a bit of bullying in school, both due to his autism and his queerness. That was fun. And um, I think for, in this play, I was kind of able to communicate, I, I hope with this play, I'm able to communicate with um, 
both autistic and non-autistic children is like, it's okay to like, just be angry. Obviously don't hurt anyone, but like, if you need to like cry or scream or just like have some kind of major emotional release of rage or some sort of, or joy or um, alleviation, like it's okay. Like your feelings are valid and you are okay. Mm -hmm. um that's kind of where I am with my writing right now mm -hmm. but that could change next week I don't know <laughs> of course <laughs> Amina or Jeremy um can you repeat this so it's like where do we see our yeah I mean, going ever like in the future or is that what you know, like if you look at, at your work that you've written that's behind you work of, of work of the past and work that you know that you want to write in the future, not a specific story, just the kind of work that you like to write in the future. Can you can you summarize all that and say this is what I want to put out in the universe? Um, I guess I mean I I feel like I try I mean I try to approach all of my work from a place of empathy and like trying to understand um, people I guess and the world the world in which we live because uh, yeah, I really although and I'm deeply fascinated by people and I work really hard to provide space for people who have not had space uh, to have their stories told. Cause right. I feel like the more you hear from different people, the more nuanced your understanding of the world is. So, mm -hmm. I mean, my work is changing too. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm, I think I've, I've already been in a kind of metaphorical abstract place and I don't even know if that's a good thing necessarily because now it's becoming even more metaphorical and <laughs> abstract, but I think it might just be the quarantine. It's just making my writing really weird, but <laughs> so <laughs> that a grain of salt. Um, <laughs> or like, or like now I'm trying to write really cheerful plays um, about happy things, uh, which I don't do a lot. Um, <laughs> But I think for the future, I just want to keep growing. And, you know, like Dean said, I, I don't know necessarily when I sit down to write a new play, like how to do it sometimes, or like, even though you've written many plays. So I just want to keep adding to my toolbox of stuff and figuring out new and interesting ways to ask the questions that I have about the world that we live. Cause I don't, I never provide answers. It's just kind of like, well, here's a thing. Here's a, an access point for a conversation. Right. Um, here's what I'm obsessing over, and I and let's have a chat about it through this play. Sure, that's great, Jeremy. Um, I know that we're wrapping, so I'll be brief on mine. I think I'm in a little bit of a time where yesterday I might have had a different answer, and tomorrow I might have a different answer. Uh -huh. So today's answer is that um, it's less about what I write about, but how. I'm thinking, you know, this 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 um, experience in itself of how we can sort of use theater to cross boundaries, how we can use theater to bring together, um, as opposed to some of the, I guess I found myself narrowed in what I think of what theater is and, and is, is, is function is for, that it's supposed to be this theater, I submit to this place, if this person does it, then that's success. And I'm thinking a lot more, really, I may have lost a little bit of why I came to it in the beginning and Spectrum Theater Ensemble helped recover that in the sense that like, where can we um, use, where, where does the professional meet the community instead of these two things being separate? Mm -hmm. Where can um, theater fulfill things that are relevant or needed by community um, as opposed to making it and saying, come and see us and, and maybe we'll give you free tickets if you can't afford it. And, um, and, uh, also just opening up the process to not just be me alone in, in my attic and then here's the play, but um, bringing in whoever the play is about to be in the room and then to be in the audience. And um, I don't know where those places are and those spaces are. There's some places, there's a mix of other places, but I think that's something I'm more interested in moving towards um, going forward. Sure. So we have just a little bit of time left. And I, I just want to say, if we were all smart, we would have invested in Zoom technology before this whole pandemic, because <laughs> <laughs> we would be very wealthy people right now. <laughs> so, but I do, and, and that actually is part of my question to you, which is, you, you know, look what we're doing. We're having a conference through Zoom, right? 
And and I, I don't know about you, but every day I get another uh, uh, notice of a reading or a production of some sort that's gonna happen on Zoom. And you will in part uh, be creating these new plays or if not for Spectrum, the next company you're working with will either be in rehearsal on Zoom or in production on Zoom or a reading on Zoom. How Are you doing well with this or is this just yeah. confounding to you? Yeah. Oh. I'm, Tell I'm, writing, <laughs> I'm writing fiction. I'm sorry. Yeah. Stop writing more fiction. I know. <laughs> Sounds like no, a horror I'm, story. It's a horror story. Well, I think. I mean, it's hard because I think theater is. Um, you know, it's a form of storytelling. So we're we're still telling stories. Um, I just think theater people or people who are into theater or people who have an interest in theater, they like being in the same room together and having like that kind of tactile thing and like what about dance and music and how does that translate into I don't know I think it's very early for me to, to sort of wrap my mind around the future <laughs> of theater and what that will be if it's going to be on zoom you bet which I, I hope not I mean it's fine like zoom is fine but I hope that we are not living on zoom as a theatrical community forever <laughs> I just yeah I agree in that I definitely don't think zoom is a replacement for theater but I I went to a reading that a colleague of mine did last weekend and we had a bunch of other colleagues come and see it and it was just so great to at least kind of feel like you're in the same room as everyone obviously it's not the same it will never be the same but I do think that um there is a capability of having plays on Zoom for people from all over the country to come together and watch a work in progress or a reading of something. So I do think there are opportunities to kind of foster and build like a tighter knit community across the country through Zoom that I don't that like geography kind of prevents um, in many ways, but you're being in person. I mean, I watched the, um, 72 miles to go from Roundabout Theater Company recently. And since I'm in Arizona, I wouldn't have been able to go see that. Sure. So I think there are there is a silver lining to it, but I do agree that yeah. I hope Zoom is not a permanent replacement. It's tough. So listen, you guys, I'm getting the wrap up. I just wanna say thank you all for sharing a, a small part of your story. And we certainly look forward to the work that you're doing for Spectrum and also the work well beyond that. So again, many thanks for sharing. Uh, thank you, Gary. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Gary. Thank You're welcome. Gary. Thank you. Clay, are you with us? I am. And yes, um, ditto what Gary said to all the playwrights. Thank you so much for engaging in this conversation. And thank you, Gary, for moderating it for us. So nice to see all your faces and I'll hopefully talk to you, EG, all very soon. Um, so we're going to take a quick break but be back at 3.40 with another spotlight on CAR, which is